if you were to go into a battle, if you were to be fully engaged in a, a war, the question is, would you go without having the right weapons for warfare? Would you go into that battle without having really thought out, having the things that you need to, to fight that war effectively? And obviously the answer is no. But each and every single day, we all are, when we step out of, of not, I was going to say when we step out of our house, but really when you crawl out of bed, the battle has begun. And you've got to understand, you know, we've, we've, we, we talked about this in earlier segments, uh, that Satan has a hit on your head. The second that you came to Christ, Satan began his attack on your life, and he wanted to figure out ways to bring you down. And today we're going to talk about just really arming yourself with the right weapons of war to make sure that you maximize your effectiveness to really ready yourself and your family for the win. Before we get into it, I just want to uh, encourage you, if you were not able to join us for the previous messages, go back. If you're watching by uh, YouTube, go back and look at these videos and, and, and really look at what we've pulled you through. Look at the lessons that we've brought to you because they really are life-changing. They really do help you to understand that we are in a war, and it's not against flesh and blood. It's against principalities. It's against spiritual powers of darkness. And I know that sounds so crazy and kind of out there, but it's so true. So if you have your word or a smartphone, turn with me to Ephesians chapter 6. We're going to be reading verses 10 through 13 to begin. And it says this, Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. We talked about what are the wiles. The wiles, that word, we don't use it today. It literally means strategies, tactics, or schemes of the devil. Verse 12, for we do not wrestle against flesh and blood. We're not in a battle against one another, but against principalities, against powers, against rulers of the darkness of this age, and against spiritual hosts of wickedness in heavenly places. This is literally a demonic army that is out to get each and every one of us. As Brad said, we all have a hit on our head when we accept Christ into our life. Verse 13, therefore, take up the whole armor of God. Everybody say whole. We're going to take up the whole armor of God, not one piece. Today, we're going to look at the weapons. We're not going to take just one. We're going to take up the entire armor of God that you may be able to withstand in the evil day. And having done all to stand, stand. Go on to verse 14. Stand therefore, or in other words, hold your ground. Having tightened the belt of truth around your loins or your waist, and having put on the breastplate, your word is going to say righteousness, but it means integrity and of moral rectitude and right standing or right positioning with God. We talked about that in part two last week. And having shod your feet in preparation to face the enemy with a firm-footed stability, the promptness and the readiness produced by the good news, the gospel of peace. Verse 16, lift up all of the covering, the shield of faith, upon which you are able to quench all the flaming missiles of the wicked one, and take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God. Final verse 18, praying at all times on every occasion in every season in the Spirit with all manner of prayer. To that end, keep alert and watch with strong purpose and perseverance, interceding on behalf of all the saints, God's consecrated people. We're going to now go through each part of the armor of God. But before we do that, I want you to understand the beginning of this said that we are to take on the whole armor of of God. Every piece has a purpose. And it's so important that we understand you may have grown up in church and maybe you've heard about the armor of God or in kids church you sang about it. 
But I want you to understand that every single piece, there's a purpose behind the symbolism. And this armor was truly armor that a Roman soldier would have worn. So the apostle Paul, he wrote the book of Ephesians. And when he wrote this to the church in Ephesus, he wrote it knowing they understood what a Roman officer's armor looked like. Now for you and I, we don't see Roman officers running around every day. So it's a little harder for us to grasp it. But I want you to understand as we go through this that each piece of armor has a very specific task in our spiritual war. So we're going to open up and we're going to look first at the belt of truth. It started back in the garden. He began with Adam and Eve. When he, when he told Adam and Eve, did God surely say that you would die if you eat this fruit? Surely you're not going to die. You're just going to gain all this knowledge and become like God. That's why he doesn't want you to know. And so you see how he strategically used in that moment a lie to try to create an opportunity for them to think differently which would lead them to tripping up and falling. Absolutely. I remember just a quick story that when, when we were first married and we were struggling, you know, a lot of times when you get married, you think it's going to be the white picket fence, and instead it's like World War III <laughs> yeah. within your house. And I remember the enemy planting thoughts in my mind of you married the wrong person. You married the wrong person. Divorce is the only option. And Brad and I had made a covenant. We would never, we would never say the word divorce in our home. Right. Um, because when we said I do, it was forever and there was no going back. But when the enemy started sowing those, if I would have meditated on that, I don't know where we would be today. And the enemy did the same thing um, in Brad's mind. But as I began to have to do battle, I had to go to the word of God and I had to I had to read it and I had to stand on what is the truth. The truth is I made a covenant before Almighty God to love the man standing next to me. And so what I had to do is go to Ephesians 5 and I had to begin to read what a woman's job was and that was to come under the mission or to respect my husband and to submit to my husband and begin to pray that God would would bring us together. And as we begin to stand on the truth, our marriage began to change to where we are today. We have an awesome marriage. But the enemy will plant those thoughts in your mind, those lies in your head, and you just have to go to the Word of God and stand on the truth. And it goes on, we are to put on the breastplate of righteousness. What do you think a breastplate did? It protected the vital organs that were located in the chest. So obviously, our heart. You know, the Bible tells us in Proverbs 4 and 23, it says, guard your heart above all else, for it determines the course That's of good. your life. That's good. How many times have you heard people in the world say, just follow your heart? Just follow your heart. Do what, just do what feels good. Follow your heart. And I would say that is the worst advice you could ever take. You don't just follow your heart. You follow God's word. You guard your heart because the enemy wants to deceive you. And the Bible says the heart above all things is deceitful. Exactly. And last week we talked about being in right positioning. What is righteousness? Righteousness is being in right positioning with God. If you're in right positioning with God, then you're able to hear from God. If you're in right positioning with God, you're able to guard your heart and your mind. And when the enemy comes in planting those lies and trying to um, hurl those darts, those fiery darts at you, the temptations, you're able to realize and recognize, wait a second. This is simply Satan. This is simply an attack against me. And I'm going to stand in right position. I'm not going to move out from underneath the umbrella when it's raining. That would get me soaked. I'm not going to move out from God's direction. I'm going to continue to do what God has told me to do. And so we've got to remember that we've got to put on every single day righteousness. That is, you get up and you get in right position. What does that look like? I get up every single day with the same routine. Right. Successful people have habits that they have in place. Every day of my life, I get up and I read God's word. Every day of my life, I read God's word and then I pray. And I ask God to help me today to not sin. Help me today, God, to do what you've called me to do. Help me today, God, to walk in the spirit. If you don't get up and you don't get in God's word, and you don't pray, and you don't get the, the armor of God on for the day, you are a walking target ready to be annihilated by the enemy. And, and those people who do life every day without the breastplate of righteousness are those people that live life 
being led by their emotions and by their feelings and by, you know, we hear the phrase a lot, just, just follow your heart or just what is your gut telling you? Yeah, if you do that, you're stepping out without, without any protection yes. over your vital organs, and you are just asking to be shot and killed by the enemy. Don't do that to yourself. As pastors, oh my goodness, we see so many people step into stupid relationships. They make really bad decisions because they're stepping out. I'm just in love, and he just, he, ma he loves me. He makes me feel so good about myself, and he's like no other person I've ever met before in my life, just the way he makes me feel, and I'm just, I'm just on cloud, I feel like I'm walking on clouds, and it's just so wonderful, and, and, and that, ladies and gentlemen, is called lust. What that is, is that's you just being led and pulled astray by your emotions. It is really easy to like or to fall in love with almost anybody. I mean, for a guy especially, you put a beautiful woman in front of a guy, yeah, you, you can easily and quickly say that you're in love because she's beautiful. But that is just this, has this much to do with the relationship. And, and, and when we get all of our emotions, our feelings, all wrapped up into this thing, we are so deceived. We're not in right positioning. It's not about what you think or what you feel about that relationship. It's what is God saying exactly. about this relationship. Because I can tell you this, just as a side note, the Bible says that we're not to be unequally yoked with non-believers. So if you're telling me that the person you're engaging, you're moving forward with in this relationship isn't a believer, you're saying, I just really feel, careful of using that word, I just really feel feel like this person is God's will for my life. Well, okay, but are they a believer? That's just the first question. That's the truth. That's we the have truth. To ask, because right? the Bible says not to be unequally out. Right. So, it, it, well, yeah, but I just really feel like I have an opportunity to witness to them and to, to minister to them. And they said they were going to come to church with me. And But I'm telling you, that's hogwash. You, all you're doing is setting yourself up because you're being led by your emotions rather than right positioning with Christ. And also going back to the belt of truth, you're going to, you're, 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 cloak, your tunic is going gonna, is gonna to trip you up, you're going to fall, you're going to stumble, and you're just asking to be taken out by the enemy. That's just one example of wearing that breastplate of righteousness. Don't be led by your feelings. Don't be led by emotions. Be led by right positioning with God, and God will speak to you clearly each and every time. The next thing we're going to talk about really quickly is the shoes of peace. And, and we read in John 16 and 33, he says, Have I told you all that this so that you may have peace in me, Jesus? Here on earth you will have many trials and sorrows, but take heart because I have overcome the world. Jesus gives us peace like like. You cannot even begin to imagine the peace of God that he gives us that surpasses all understanding. The peace that he gives us, we can't even begin to wrap our minds around or comprehend how he just calms us right in the center of our storms. But if we dig a little deeper in this part of the passage, and we're talking about the shoes of peace, we're talking about the shoes of the gospel of Christ, and peace comes as a result of, of understanding what God has done in your life by bringing you salvation, but he also gives you peace in knowing that he has equipped you to share that story, the story he's given you of what he's done in your life with others and that you can bring peace to them. It's so deep. It's so much deeper than people realize just at, 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 for face value when you read this text. You really don't understand the depth of what it's saying. But I want you to understand today that when you put on those shoes of peace, really what you're doing is you're saying each and every day, God, I understand that you have given me salvation. I understand what it means, and, and I'm thankful for the peace that it brings. But I'm also telling you, Lord, that I'm committed, I'm ready, I'm willing to step out in my life at every opportunity that you give me to share my story of peace that you've given me to share with others so that they too can become transformed and changed, radically made over by the grace of God so that they can have peace in their lives as well. Paul said it so well. He said, I am instant 
in season and out of season. I'm ready to give an account and a witness. I'm ready to give a testimony he, to anybody that needs to hear it. I'm always ready to share who Christ is and what he's done in my life and how he's changed my life. And that brings peace. So put on the shoes every morning. When you get dressed in the morning, I want you to imagine yourself putting on the shoes of peace. Put on the belt of truth. Put on that breastplate of righteousness and just align your mind with how Christ expects you to walk through that day. Because remember, when you climb out of bed, the battle has begun. That's right. And you know, when you think about God giving you those opportunities to share your story, you know, some people call it witnessing. I think it's easier to say, share my story. What has God done in my life? That kind of right. takes the edge off. It's not so scary. You don't have to know every scripture in the book. You can simply tell people what God has done in your life. And here's the deal. No matter what happens today, when the world begins to see you deal with your problems, and remember, we live in a world where we're going to have tribulations, we're going to have heartaches. Jesus has overcome the world. When the world begins to see you dealing with junk, but yet you're still calm, and you're still holding your composure, and you're still at peace, then they ask the question you want them to ask. They say, how are you doing it? How are you handling the diagnosis that the doctor has given you? How are you making it through after that accident? How are you handling this, this thing, this junk? And then you begin to say, can I share my story with you? And they say, absolutely, because they're the one who ask, right? And so you're able then to share with them the gospel message of how Jesus is the only reason you're making it through. The shield of faith was a piece of armor that literally would have covered most of the body. We think a lot of times of a little shield like um, Captain America's. It wasn't like Captain America's. You mean America's. the shield I have at home? The one in you... the closet <laughs> that I use every night when I go to work? Yes, yeah. because you were a ninja. <laughs> no, um, I'm Captain America. Now you're Captain America. Yeah. Obviously, you guys know what Brad wanted to do Part-time for a living. Job. He wanted to be a superhero. Superhero. But the shield. So I settled for a ninja. Sorry. That's right. <laughs> the shield would have covered from the chest area all the way to the ground. Okay? So it was a large shield that they would have held out. And the Bible says that the shield of faith would defend us against the fiery darts that the enemy was aiming directly at us. Now, a fiery dart literally was a flammable like arrow that they would shoot. And obviously, what does fire do? Fire engulfs something with intent to destroy. You start a fire, you intend to burn or consume whatever it is that's being set on fire. We've seen the effects of fires, unfortunately, with people's homes and with um, structures and forest fires. We know what fire does. When the enemy hurls these darts at us, he's doing it because John 10 and 10, we learned this in part two, says that he has come to steal, to kill, and to what? To destroy. destroy. So when he hurls these darts, what are these darts? These darts can be anything that will cause you to um, trip up or be destroyed or be frustrated. It can be temptation. You know, the enemy is going to cause you to have opportunity to stumble and fall every day. But the Bible says that it's the shield of faith. So when the enemy begins to tell you in your mind those fearful thoughts, what the doctor has said is going to take your life. That's you know, my marriage is going to, my marriage is going to end and, or my kids are just, they're driving me crazy. I can't do anything with them. He begins to hurl these lies at you. Faith says, I'm not going to believe what the situation in front of me says. I'm going to believe what God's word says that greater is he that is in me than he that is in the world. See, faith is the substance of things hoped for the evidence of things not seen. So even though my situation may look grim right now, I'm going to believe that God is still in control. I'm going to put the shield of faith out. And when I do that, I'm going to deflect the enemy's darts. And he's going to, the Bible says, when you resist the enemy, he will flee. You see your circumstances and your situation, not as they really are, but as God sees those circumstances. And, and that's really what the, what the Bible it means when, when it says, and I think it's Matthew 19, 26, says that with God or with man, these things that are in front of you, the situation that you're faced with, it, it's impossible. It's impossible, but with God. And you know what's crazy is, uh, you know, I was doing this, 
I, I, in college, I thought I was this great Greek master, and I was learning the language, and, and, and every word was so deep and so full of all this information. And so one day, I, I, I just, I tore apart that word just with. <laughs> and I said, man, this is, this is, I, I can't believe that there's so much here, but believe it or not, there really is. It, it, it means, it means alongside. And, and when, when you do battles, when you do your day, when you do life alongside God, his word says, all things become possible. Whereas before they weren't because you were alongside man. You were alongside the thinking of man. You were alongside doing things the way you thought they ought to be done. You were alongside seeing things the way that you saw them rather than aligning yourself next to or alongside God the one who created everything and gave us breath and gave us life and gave us a destiny a future and a hope so so as you're moving forward uh, each and every day with your shield of faith man do it alongside God and your shield will do the job that it's supposed to do it's the helmet of salvation I love it because the helmet covers your nugget right it covers your skull it protects your head when 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 you look at snipers when you look at what their job is usually if they can take a headshot they know that they can kill immediately they can take somebody out they're always going to go for the head because if you can take the head out you can take out the whole body it's just like a snake you know if you see a snake in your yard especially a poisonous snake and i know some people they say the only kind of good snake is a dead snake i don't agree with that per se <laughs> misty agrees with that i don't you know black snakes black rat snakes are awesome snakes to have around because they kill other venomous snakes so i kind of like them misty says no it needs to die so at any rate we know that if you really want to take a snake out take its head off with a shovel and you're going to kill it fast that's how brutal and gruesome my wife is folks she she has no respect for the creation of god and so so but we know that if you take the head out you can take out the whole body and that's exactly the attack and the strategy that Satan has on us is he wants to take out your head. He wants to behead you. He wants to totally annihilate you because he knows that he'll take out your whole body as well. So what we have to do in our response to that, our, our reaction is that we need to put that helmet of salvation over the top of our head. And the helmet of salvation helps us to basically continually remember and value and, and be thankful for the fact that God has given us salvation. And, and we need to cling to that each and every day. And just remember what he's done in our life. Because what that does is it keeps it fresh on our mind. It helps us to just continually just be in the mode and in the zone of saying, God, look at what you've done. I mean, it's like just staying in awe of, wow, look at how messed up my life was look at how I had no peace I had no hope I had no future and now God you've given me heaven as my home you know I gave my life to Christ when I was 12 but didn't quite stick you know uh, I went back to the same school to the same friends to the same music the same influences and it was so difficult as a young person to really stay connected and committed to God it was so difficult so I was in and out of church for a long time from the time I was 12 until the time I was about 19 years old I had seasons where I was in church and I was really, you know, following hard after God and loving Him and honoring Him, reading His Word. And there was times when I was totally on the other end of the spectrum, living for myself and living in sin. But when I gave my life to Christ at 19, when I really, really made that commitment, it stuck. And I made a decision from that moment forward that I was going to live for God no matter what. I wasn't going to let anything get in the way. I was going to make church my home. I was going to be there every time the doors were open. I was going to make the Word of God my life. I was going to learn how to pray and connect and, and communicate with God in a real way. I, don't, I didn't want to live just a natural life. I wanted to live a supernatural life. But, but it's amazing to me is that as, as all these years have gone by now, that was, that was like 1997, I believe, and, and, and my faith and my appreciation for my salvation has grown stronger and stronger and stronger and stronger as each year goes by. And now I found myself, as each day goes by, I'm my, 
my affinity and my appreciation, the value that I hold in my heart for my salvation grows stronger and stronger. And I just, I, think, I find myself thanking God continually for what He's done in my heart and in my life. Continually, over and over and over. Because the more I live, the older I get, the more I just see things in life happening around me and in other people's lives. I see heaven drawing closer and closer and closer and becoming more of a reality more than ever before. And it becomes more and more valuable to me each and every day. And, and I, I long for it. I, I cling to heaven as my hope and my home. I cling to Christ for who He is. And, and I, I thank Him so much. But that's that helmet of salvation. It's an attitude every day of saying, you know what? Heaven is my home, and God has done an amazing thing in my life. He has transformed me radically. All the old junk is passed away, and behold, all things have become new. And each and every day, I cause myself, by putting on that helmet of salvation, to, to remember what He's done and to value it so that it stays fresh in my heart and in my mind. And each day, it's just as if I gave my heart and my life to Christ yesterday. And the last piece of this armor that we're going to put in our hand, I love it. The Bible says it's the sword of the Spirit. What is the sword of the Spirit? The sword of the Spirit is God's Word. This is all you need. You put it in your heart. The Bible says in Psalms, I'm going to hide God's Word in my heart that I might not sin against you. I'm going to read God's Word every day. I'm going to memorize scriptures. I'm going to have in my arsenal, if you will, passages of scriptures that when the enemy comes up against me and he begins to tempt me and he begins to try to trip me up and he begins to lie to me, there's going to be scriptures that I have memorized that I'm going to quote back to him. You see, in Matthew 4, when Jesus was tempted, and it's amazing that everything we go through, Jesus already went through it victoriously. Do you hear that? In Matthew 4, we see that Jesus had fasted for 40 days and 40 nights. He comes out of the wilderness, and immediately he's physically tired. He's spiritually exhausted, and he is starving. All right? Try going without food for 40 days. And the enemy right then comes to tempt him. What does that tell you and me? When you're emotionally weak, when you're physically tired, when you're already exhausted, that's when you're going to get hammered. You're vulnerable. You are very vulnerable. You're going to get hammered. But each time that he's tempted, Jesus responds with a sentence, and I love it. And the sentence is this, Satan, it is written. What's written? And then he quotes the word of God. Satan, it is written, do not tempt the Lord your God. It is written, man does not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. When the enemy comes to you, you've got to have a word already deep in your heart because you don't have time to be looking one up before you stumble. You hear me? That's why it's so important to read the word of God. The Bible says in Hebrews 4 and 12, for the word of God, it's alive and it's powerful. Say that with me. It's alive and it's alive. it is powerful. It is powerful. It is sharper than any two-edged sword, cutting between the soul and spirit, between joint and marrow. It exposes our innermost thoughts and desires. You see, when I begin to read the Word of God, I begin to align my life with God's values. I begin to say, wow, the things I'm reading, my life isn't exactly lining up. I need to get over here, and I need to walk a little bit differently. I need to talk. A little bit differently. I need to align my life with the Word of God. Then when the enemy comes, I have a scripture in my mind. Greater is he that is in me than he that is in the world. Because here's the deal. If Jesus has come to live on the inside of you and you've accepted him, then nothing that the enemy can ever throw at you is going to bring you down. Because if you read the end of this book, you go to the book of Revelation, you begin to read what happens to Satan when Jesus comes back, when the rapture happens, when the end of time happens, and you begin to see Satan's future is to be bound for a thousand years thrown into a pit and then ultimately into hell, the lake of fire for all eternity. So you and I, we're going to do battle every day, okay? It's just life. It's just the way that it is. Nobody ever said you are supposed to take Satan out. Jesus died so that he could conquer Satan. Our job is to stand up, fully armed with one weapon in your hand. This is all you need. 
And you need to realize that at the end of that passage, it says, and having done all to stand, stand. It's action, guys. It takes doing something. You're not going to crawl into a hole and die. You may fall. You may get tripped up one day because you don't have on the belt of truth, but you're not going to stay down. You're going to get back up and you're going to stand again. And what that literally means is after you've done everything else, one battle is over, you need to be prepared to stand again because a second and a third and a fourth and so on, those battles are coming. Be prepared to stand. Right. You know, a war is just a culmination of many, many, many battles. Battle after battle after battle after battle. And those battles are never going to stop between now and the time that Christ returns. And so what you need to understand, what you need to be aware of is each and every day, the enemy is engaging in a battle against your life and you need to be ready and able. You need to be equipped and and ready to respond however you need to respond to, to advance the attack and to defend yourself against the wiles of the devil. And I want to tell you practically, just as we're closing right now, I want you to understand so many times as pastors, you know, people come to us saying, man, I just feel like I am under attack. And that's why we did this series is because we want you to understand what to do and how to be prepared. And and just know this, that continually Satan is going to be attacking all those areas of balance that we talk about here at Mountain Movers Church. He's going to get you to question God and who he is and if he's even involved in your life, if he's even there. He's going to attack your marriage relationship. He's going to attack your relationship with your children. He's going to attack your children. He's going to attack your finances continually. He's going to attack your physical body. There's going to be times where he attacks your mind and your emotions. There's going to be times when he attacks your time and how difficult it is and how Satan really uses the strategy each and every day to get us so busy that we don't have time for the things that are most important and he gets us distracted constantly and then finally he attacks your ministry he doesn't want you to be a leader he doesn't want you to 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 be involved in your church he doesn't want you to serve he doesn't want you to volunteer he doesn't want you to pursue that destiny and that dream that God has for you and a lot of times Satan will plant a mountain right in front of us so that we can't see the destiny of God but I want to tell you that that this is so encouraging God wants you to do ministry because that is your destiny. He wants you to do the thing that he's called you to do on this planet to advance his kingdom and to lead more people to him by doing what he's called you to do by utilizing your gifts and your strengths. And so I want to tell you, there's not going to be a day that goes by where you're not under attack. But the encouraging news is, is that God has given you the victory with the armor of God. And I hope that today's lesson has inspired you and has encouraged you and and my prayer is that each and every day you would fully clothe yourself in the armor of God so that you are able to withstand the attack we want to pray for you right now father God we are just so very dependent upon you and God we know that without you we can do nothing we are nothing And we also know, Lord, that the enemy is on a rampage every day. And so, Father, we pray that you would just begin right now equipping each and every person under the sound of my voice to be fully clothed in the armor of God, ready to do battle every single day, God. That you would arm us, that you would equip us, that your strength and your empowerment would be around us, Father God, so that we can win. And Lord, we know that with Christ on our side, God, he is our champion. He is the King of kings and the Lord of lords. And he gives us the victory in every battle. And we know, God, that we have already won the war. So, Father, I pray that that those who are listening today, those who are watching, would be encouraged, would be inspired to fully clothe themselves in this armor today. And Lord, if there's any of out there, Lord, that, that want to know you as Lord and Savior, Father, I pray right now. that that we would just admit in our hearts, God, that we have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God, that we would believe upon the name of Jesus to save us and, and believe what he has done is true and that we would cling to the cross, that we would confess with our mouths that he is Lord. There's none above him. And Father, that we would dedicate from this moment forward 
that we're going to live for you, that we're going to live according to your word, that we're going to make church our home, that we're going to make God's people our family. And Father, I pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. If you made that decision today, I want to thank you for making that decision because it's the best decision you can ever make in your entire life.